challenges you with the ultimate video game, the Sega Master System, with twice as much memory as any other video game. Advanced video technology like scrolling backgrounds, graphics in 64 colors, digital sounds, and light phasers. And you can add to the excitement with sports pads, control sticks, and the first video games ever in 3D. Sega's the one. The Sega Master System. The challenge will always be there. Welcome to another episode of the Gamers Lounge Podcast. My name is Nathaniel Fuller, and with me today is Eric Kubik. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, John cannot be with us this week due to some personal uh, issues and stuff, but he should be back next week. So anyway, let's continue and doing the show without him. So like we start off every week, what are you playing, Eric? Well, this week I was extremely busy with work and a few other things, and I really didn't get the chance to play anything. I dabbled a little bit of XCOM, uh, had me within, and that was about it. I didn't really play anything else, so yeah, it seems like disappointing. It seems like XCOM's turning into your thing of like me with Minecraft. It's like, yeah, I'll throw it in there even when I don't have a little time. I'll just boot it up. Yeah, just play for a little bit. I mean, I'm almost done with the game. So, And like I said before on other shows, it's very like... I don't know, sometimes when you're playing games, you're like, oh, I want to finish this, and it's, like, stressing me out. But when I play XCOM, I don't really, I don't really think about that. It's like, nothing. <laughs> Mine yeah. is blank. Yeah, so I've been playing a couple things. Minecraft, of course. A bit more of uh, some of the same things I've talked about the last couple episodes. A bit of the mod pack, a bit of creative building, a bit of, little bit of uh, doing survival server, bouncing around between those three things. Put out a couple videos of it recently too so nice nice i've been doing a little bit more of that that i hadn't done it for a while and so i put a few of those out and it's been fun again it's like i miss remember i'm missing this this is fun so when i get enough time to make videos it's good i've also done uh second assault dlc for battlefield 4 came out last week so i played a bit of that cool what would uh, what does it add what do you get that is it was out on the xbox one from the start and they had some sort of random exclusivity, and it's now finally coming out everywhere else for premium, and then regular people get it. Just can buy it, I think, the first Tuesday in March, I think is when it's so. Battlefield 4 premium can play now. What you get in Second Assault, you get, I believe, five different weapons that they're adding in, which the F-2000 is one of them, which I love that in Battlefield 3, so I'm excited to get that one. I haven't unlocked it quite yet. But uh, you get four maps that were in Battlefield 3 that have kind of been reimagined slash redone. Cool. And it's kind of the concept is this is what the maps are like after Battlefield 3. So they're all a little bit more run down even than they were in Battlefield 3. And it's beat up a little bit. Yeah, a little beat up. And then the four maps are Caspian Border, Operation Metro, Operation Firestorm, and Gulf of Oman, which is kind of a classic Battlefield map that's been in several games. So they've redone them all, and they've added a little bit of evolution type stuff to them, and they look different. Like, Caspian Border is probably the most changed, because they added this gigantic concrete wall vertically through the map between a couple of the flags on Conquest that wasn't there before. It used to be just kind of like a chain link fence. And so it's this big kind of fortified wall, and you've got these small towers and stuff you can get in, and you've got these gates that kind of gate off vehicles that, on how they get through, and you can, like, open and close them. So there's usually some sort of fighting along that wall. And then they've moved the radio tower to the top of kind of the hilltop in the middle of the flag instead of being off to the side. It's kind of like a... Well, technically it's a new radio tower because the... If you remember in Battlefield 3, at the end of the match, the 
or a radio tower would fall down. So there's kind of a little remains of that out there too, I believe. But the tower in the hilltop one also has kind of an underground bunker thing so that you can have. There's like two or three more ways to get up to that flag that was already heavily contested before in Battlefield 3's layout. So you can go in there and set a timer and then when time runs out, the tower will blow up and fall down and it crushes part of the wall. So there's another way through the wall. and You can like go up through the inside of the tower and you can do that while it's up as well. So it's just kind of an interesting new way to play on it. Yeah, that, I mean that sounds really cool. So here, here's a question regarding yeah. the game. So I have it on I have it on PS4 and I played barely any of it. But my brother yes. wants to get it on P. He wants to get it on PC and my PC can run it. So I'm thinking about you know going out and I've seen online is cheap for the whole premium for thirty bucks. Granted, I, this is not through like I do know they're doing like a Battlefield channels. sale currently right now. I haven't looked exactly to see exactly what that is. It's like some often i don't know if that's premium as well you will they don't have a premium edition out yet like they did with battlefield 3 i'm sure it will be coming at some point in the future but so you still have to buy them both separately but yeah i don't know i have premium and it's worth it for me because i plan on playing the game even though i've not played it tons quite yet i'll still be coming back to it enough that yeah it'll be good and it's fun so far like you know the maps look a lot better They've tweaked them graphically and stuff. They look better than they did in Battlefield 3, which they already looked really good. I lo the uh, Caspian border is set during autumn this time, so all the trees are all colorful and stuff, so it makes the map feel a lot different. It's pretty cool. Metro is pretty much the same. They've added a couple side hallway doors and things, but mostly it's the same. There's bits of the ceiling that you can uh, make collapse because they're kind of propped up by 2 by 4s and stuff. You shoot them out and they collapse on people's heads. I don't think it kills you. I think it just kind of stuns you. Or I could be wrong. I don't know. I haven't actually been under one yet, so I don't know. And then they've made the elevators work. So that's, that's kind of funny. That's like, a, a lot of times people would camp the escalators, and they had the elevators behind them. But like, you don't have to matter. I had one time I went up in the elevators and actually was able to get people from behind because they aren't thinking about that yet. I have to remember that. Yeah, I need to. I definitely need to play more. I don't know why I just haven't played more, but eh. yeah. PS4. Well, even the base maps are pretty good. And I, I don't know. It's one of those things where a lot of the friends I play with are debating. Some of them like it better than others. And as far as the bugs and stuff in the game, there's all that that there's some people getting really up in arms with because they have to deal with it more than some other people. It's kind of weirdly inconsistent mm -hmm. on who gets hit with what, but there's still yeah, plenty but of issues. But it's still a lot of fun to play. And the one thing that kind of like we had some of the friends were talking with somebody is like, hey, sh why should I buy this game or should I, you know, avoid it? And the big thing we've kind of boiled it down to is if you can deal with a few, you know, a little bit of inconsistency, you can still have fun with it. Mostly if you like conquest mode. Yeah. Because a lot of the issues some of my friends have with they like rush and a couple of the other game modes better, and they don't like Battlefield 4 quite as much from a map design aspect because they did the design based around Conquest first, and then we'll try and fit the other modes into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean... Fortunately yeah, for I me, just, that's my game I just game. need to play more. I just need to play more. Yeah. Even on, even on PS4, I mean, it'll still be fun. I'll still have a good time. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm probably better with a mouse and keyboard, but... Eh, I'm good enough yeah. with the controller. Hold my own. Actually, surprisingly... I kind of miss the playing it on the console because a lot of my friends still play it there, and I don't have it for that. I have it just on PC, so a lot of the people I play Battlefield 3 with, I can't play Battlefield 4 with. Yeah, surprisingly, I'm, I'm pretty good at shooters. On, yeah, I would say console and PC. I, I usually can hold my own 1-to-1 one -one or 2-to-1 kill-death ratio. So. Yeah. I'd say I'm kind of like average on both, although my console skills have been deteriorated a lot, so I'm probably not even yeah, mine, mine have <laughs> But it just all just depends. It depends what the game is. You know, Battlefield is definitely different than Call of Duty and, like, Halo yeah. and stuff like that. I like that. Battlefield because I can actually succeed in that one because I can be a support player and do stuff. Not literally the support class, but just a supporting player so I can support the team by doing things like capturing objectives or handing out ammo. I'm one of the few people who actually do that. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, you know, I don't have to be a slayer to have fun with the game because I'm never yeah, going to have the, like, 5 KD and just run around killing everyone. It's just I don't have the skills for that, but I can still have fun. I did, however, have a lot of success this week. I hadn't been playing for a while, so when I started up, I was like, I'm going to play with the light machine guns so I don't have to worry about bullets quite as much. 
because, you know, if you're a little out of practice, not having to reload is one less thing you have to think about. So I was playing yep. with the, one of the heavier hitting ones, and I was just tearing people up. It was fun. So, yeah, that's what I've been playing. Not a whole lot, but anyway. More than me. Yeah, a little more than you, I guess. So let's move on to the small amount of news that we have. Uh, the big one that happened kind of just right after we recorded last week was that the Bioshock developer Irrational Games is going to be shutting down or kind of winding down, I believe is the term they use. They're going to cut it down to, you know, like kind of a 15-person okay, team yeah. with Ken Levine. Skeleton staff pretty much getting rid of most everybody. Yeah, and it's kind of I've been reading up on it since then. There's been some rumors and some follow-ups and some more information kind of swirling around. It's like, what does this mean? You know, like, is this good for the industry, bad for the industry? Whose fault is it? Was it 2K? Was it Ken Levine? And we still really don't know for sure. But it's like we don't know if Take-Two came to him and said, hey, we want you to shrink the team, or if he kind of went to 2K and said, hey, I want to do a small team, and then 2K said, well, that means you got to shut down and fire a bunch of people. Who knows? Yeah, we don't really know, unfortunately. And all everything is just rumors and hearsay now. Yeah, this kind of uh, makes me think of oh, well, the, Jaffe. What's his first name? The guy who's like a PlayStation developer that has done like uh, the, the God of War stuff in the past, and like he went and was doing all these huge games for a long time, and then he just kind of got a little bit. David Jaffe. Yeah, David. That was his first name. Like he's. It was a while back after he did some God of War stuff. He wanted to do smaller things, and he did, like, the I think it was Calling All Cars or whatever. He wanted to do smaller stuff, and then that didn't work, and he went back and did a Twisted Metal reboot, and I don't even yeah. know what he's working on now. This kind of seems similar, where Ken Levine has been doing Bioshock and big games for a while, and he just came off of Bioshock Infinite, which was, like, what, five years, I think, they were making that yeah, game? Yeah, it was a lot of time. That will tire anyone out, so I, it seems kind of like whether it was his idea to start with or this is just facilitating it that he wants to do some smaller stuff. And for, uh, He has like an official statement kind of on their website that kind of goes into that a little bit about they want to do smaller focused narrative games with a small team kind of a deal. Well, Bioshock's a good game. I, I, I don't think, you know, I think the game was successful. It sold well, made money. Oh, yeah. It's broke. But I also heard it's very, very expensive to make, so who knows. Well, any game that takes five years isn't going to be cheap, but plus, you know, like, they spend a pretty penny on that, I'm sure. Yeah. Speaking of which, is another game where I need to go back and finish the DLC. I have the season pass for PC mm -hmm. for... Got it for yeah, next to nothing. I don't know if I'll ever I play to... it, because, I don't know, it's Bioshock Infinite was one of those games where it's like, I'm not sh sure I want any more. And from what I've heard about it, it's like, it's kind of, it would be okay. So I'm going to wait and see till the, like, second part. Because yeah, I mean, they are still working on that. They're going to finish that up. So the set, when the second part of uh, the, was it Burial Let's See? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when that comes out and see what people think of it, and then maybe I'll do both parts at the same time or something. Yeah, it wasn't, I mean, for me, you know, people are like, oh, game of the year, game of the year. And for me, I was like, yeah, it's not really game of the year for me. It's a good game, but it just wasn't game of the year for me. Yeah, it definitely was for me. I had a blast with that game which we've already talked about that on previous shows of some sort or another, but yes, Bioshock <laughs> Infinite was definitely one of my favorite games from last year. It was a lot of fun. The right. uh, rest of the stuff we have isn't super big news, just kind of like a little bit of tiddly bit stuff. Is, uh, Assassin's, talk Creed, about anyway. yeah, Assassin's Creed 5 is not going to be set in Japan, according to uh, well, Jade Raymond, whatever her title is now. Ubisoft Toronto Executive is what it says in the article. So she's part of the Assassin's Creed franchise and said something about while well, she was talking about that it will not be in Japan, which apparently I guess there's some rumors about that. I don't know why she said, hey, it's not going mm. to be. And it's like, okay, well, tell us what the game is, not what it isn't. But Yeah, I thought it was going to be in Japan. I thought it was like... Who knows? Yeah, I mean, that, knows? if you go through all of the Assassin's Creed games and look at all the little, like, puzzle things and all the little, like, references to different eras and settings and things that are throughout all those games, they could do anything at this point. Yeah. I don't know, I think Japan could be okay, depending on what era, but I think they could do something that would be a little more interesting that fit that franchise a bit better, but... Who Japan knows? would be cool. I would be interested. It'd be cool. But, you know, I mean, they, they have lots of options. They can go lots of places. Yeah, that's the cool thing about that franchise, and especially with the way they did 4, is, like, we're not tied to one ancestral kind of yeah. bloodline anymore. No. We can just do anything. 
Yep. No more. Yeah, they can no more Renaissance stuff. They can go anywhere. They can go, you know, back to the Caribbean. They go back to American history. Who knows? Maybe we'll take it further. I mean, there's tons of different options. So another thing that was uh, recently that showed up on gaming news uh, was Gearbox is suing 3D Realms over an unsanctioned Duke Nukem game, which <laughs> amused me. <laughs> Yeah, I do a little bit. I'm like, oh. It looks Duke like Nukem. that 3D Realms just decided, well, you know, we sold Duke Nukem, but that doesn't matter. We'll just do this anyway. And from the little bit I know about it, it seems like they were kind of just trying to pull a fast one. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, it Who looks knows? like I was I was looking I was reading a little bit about it, and it looks like it was supposed to be um, a isometric action role playing game for PC and P- PS4. I was like, really? Mm-hmm. And I was trying to like picture this. I was like. Okay, it's kind of cool. I mean, Duke Nukem Forever is not a very good game. Sorry. No. I'll be one of those suckers that played it at PAX. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> and I bought it for like full price. And afterwards, I was like, oh, man. So yeah, I'm one of those a- weirdos that didn't even like Duke 3D all that much. Like, everyone thinks it's such a classic game. I was like, it's okay. But I prefer Duke Nukem and Duke Nukem 2, like the 2D side-scroller things. Yeah, those are good games. Where you're picking up, like, you know, soda cans and stuff for power-ups and all sorts of stuff. Like, those are fun. I played those when that's, I was growing up. That's what the hype, kind of, the hype kind of reminds me of that a little bit, actually. Yeah. I was thinking about that in, like, um, games like Alien Carnage or Halloween Harry. Games, you know play on the PC back in the early 90s. I was like, Ooh. Commander Keen. Oh, that's Imagine great what game. a Commander there, Keen reboot oh, would be. I, HD. I don't even know what they would do if they tried to reboot that franchise now. <laughs> there's a nice, I know there's a Steam, I thought there was a, either on GOG or Steam, you could get the pack of all the games. I was like, I should do that. And I was like, wait, I bet those games have not aged well, though. Oh, I doubt it, but. And the first one's pretty crummy. But the, the last, the later two were pretty good. So, I mean, that was, uh, that was, that was, what's her name? A- Apogee, right? I believe that was an Apache one, but I don't remember. That was, those were the guys behind, you know, Doom and stuff like that. that yeah. Was their, was their little they put out a lot of stuff that was in that sort of uh, shareware kind of era of games. That is a good idea, though. I mean, you get the, you get them hooked for the first uh, episode or so. Oh, yeah. I definitely got hooked as a kid growing up on some of them things, like play a little bit and like, oh, I want more. Yeah, yeah. That could be an interesting topic sometime. Um, let's see. What else do we got going on? We've got the Titanfall beta. Pulled in 2 million unique players. Yay. Yeah. Okay. AKA, that? lots of people want to see what this game is. That was both the PC and the Xbox One, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Sounds like it went Xbox. pretty well for them. They got to test a lot of things. It went down on the Xbox for a little bit, but for a few hours they were able to get back up and they said in the article here they found 10 things that they were able to work on a fix before launch so it's like if you can get those before launch day that's good well they were running and they were patching it too i think about oh, yeah. the last yeah. show they were patching it so we got to play a little bit longer so that was pretty cool yeah i know and i played it a couple times it seemed pretty smooth so know, we'll see it's kind of one of those things where like battlefield 4 had some problems when it was in beta and then they patched a lot and when beta was by the time it was done it was running away okay and then by the time the game launched it was terrible during the launch yeah. week <laughs> like and then it's just what kind of had problems crap? spinning out and that's with well, a lot of games they'll have a beta and it's limited it doesn't have all the features in it it's its own special you know code that they've output for it and then when yeah. you come to the full game a lot of unforeseen things can show up especially in a multiplayer thing yeah, yeah, who knows? I mean, that's always something, that's a good point of the beta is, yeah, you get people a little bit of taste of what's coming, and you get to, uh, you know, and you get to work out some stuff if you have the time, so. Yeah, it looked pretty, pretty cool, so well, I'm sure it'll go pretty well. It's another, what, is it a couple of weeks when it comes out? It's just March, I just forget the date right now off the top of yeah, my head. Yeah, I was, I was listening to other podcasts, and they're, they're, they're speculating that it's going to help sell a couple thousand, a couple hundred thousand Xbox Ones. I, I could see that. Well, they are uh, having an Xbox One Titanfall package, at least in the UK. Yeah. I don't know about here in the I, US. I thought there was, you could get, I thought if you bought an Xbox One, you could get the digital copy for free or something. That was the rumor. I don't know. I There's all sorts of random stuff, but you definitely know that Microsoft is wanting Titanfall to do well so that they can sell Xbox Ones. That's kind of a rumor of why they've pushed back the 360 version of the game by just a couple <laughs> weeks, so not very long. So, who knows? I mean, and I, I still have some concerns, like we talked about on the last show, about yeah. the game. It's, it's looks like it's going to be a lot of fun, but it's going to be enough to keep people for the long run be interested. I'm not sure that that 
this point Microsoft cares. They just want to sell a ton as there far as they're go. concerned. Now, as far as, you know, Respawn and EA are concerned, sure, they want to rope people in and get them in and all the DLC in the future, all that stuff. But Microsoft is kind of hoping, I think, that it'll just be a big hit that'll get people to buy their console. Yeah. Which, hey, uh, it, it would be one. It's kind of the first potential one that they've had since launch that says, hey, I want to play this game for a lot of people. And I think having played the beta, it's a very smart product in that it's not super hardcore. It's going to appeal to a wider variety of people, I think, at least as far as people who like shooters. So mm -hmm. I, don't know. I think it's poised to do well as long as the launch goes well. I think that will probably sell quite a lot. I think I can agree with you. Okay, guys, we have a special guest this week for an interview for the show, and I'd like to introduce you to Matt Rathel. He's the studio director for uh, Graphite Lab, which is a small game studio in St. Louis. How are you doing, Matt? Doing well. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, so why don't you give us a little bit of background on uh, Graphite Lab yourself, maybe kind of where you come from, and... Tell us a bit about uh, why you're here, which is your Kickstarter project for a game called Hive Jump. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I got my start in games back in 2004 um, at a little uh, kind of college startup called Black Lantern Studios. Um, they were a group of recent graduates who really were, a lot of them were all programmers, kind of in the, the web, um, we'll call it serious programming jobs type of industry. <laughs> and... Um, They'd kind of done their thing, and they decided they were going to start a game studio. Um, and so I got connected with them pretty much right out of school as a 3D modeler, um, making games for the PC. And like a lot of authors, or at least I hear this is like this for a lot of authors, the first game that we were coming up with, nobody wanted to publish. Nobody wanted to pick up. But the second game we came up with, then everybody was like, oh, okay. Um, so... We were working on a PC game uh, called Nightclub Tycoon. It was the height of the tycoon era. Um, nobody wanted to publish that game, but they had some other games that they wanted us to make, so we kind of got into doing work for hire game development at that point. Um, it allowed us to grow the company, and over really the next five years or so, we grew Black Lantern doing mostly licensed titles, uh, games for companies like Nickelodeon and Disney, um, among a few others. Uh, but majority 90 plus percent of it was all doing licensed titles mm. uh, and all largely for uh, consoles so a handheld or, or console so we got experience on the Game Boy Advance got experience on the DS the Wii the 360 um, and we're really having a lot of fun uh, doing all that work um, however my my heart and my family was in St. Louis so in 2008 I convinced our partnership to back me in an expansion um, to St. Louis to start up a new extension of our Black Lantern studio. Um, and uh, I wanted to make that in St. Louis because that's where I'm from, and I felt like it would be a good uh, spot to expand to. Um, so in 2009, we started what would become Graphite Lab, and uh, originally it had just been St. Black Lantern St. Louis. Um, <clears throat> and our first project there was a game called Ben 10, The Rise of Hex. It was a Xbox 360 game for XBLA and, uh, and WiiWare, and um, it was for Konami and Cartoon Network, and it really gave us a good 12 months' worth of work to kind of grow the studio around. Um, once that project was finished, it was kind of one of these moments where we looked around and, and saw that nobody else really at that time, this would have been 2010, nobody else at that time really wanted to put more money into Xbox Live, we were kind of it exposed some of its own flaws and, you know, our Springfield studio was still doing all the DS and, uh, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, we work. So we were kind of looking for our, our new identity. And at that point, um, everybody was flocking to mobile. So we decided, all right, well, we can kind of be that group to investigate what mobile's all about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we really ran that same formula that we'd learned from our first studio, which is to do work for hire, licensed products, and predominantly kids brands. So anything you'd find on like a, a Nick Jr. or a you know Disney TV show, that was going to be our market. And we went after it, and we were successful. Um, we s s kind of got our footing and, and founded our name under our name Graphite Lab 
um, largely under a uh, contract with Hasbro to do games for their My Little Pony franchise and Play-Doh and Transformers, to name a few. Um, but we were doing it all on the in the mobile space. So mm-hmm. it was a little bit of a shift for me. You know, were any of those uh, mobile games you know super successful or anything? As far as just like lots of people enjoying them, I guess. Uh, yeah. So the the My Little Pony games uh, actually. Uh, just this past weekend, uh, peaked at number one in the UK um, for kids' educational apps, and um, the Play-Doh game did a similar run where it was number one in the UK. I think it peaked at like number seven overall in the UK, and um, reached less, but still pretty flattering for us uh, ranks in the US. So mm-hmm. um, nice. they do well. Um, having Hasbro as a, as a partner is great. I mean, they're wonderful to work for. Um, but, you know, we're all adapting to kind of this idea that, you know, the mobile games industry is a little bit tertiary to like what I consider to be the hardcore gamers industry. Um, so we, we kind of felt out of the loop for a little bit and that's, um, one of the things that we wanted to rectify when we came up with this game called Hive Jump. Um, so Hive Jump would be kind of a return to our core in a few different ways, I mean, Black Lantern got its start doing PC games, uh, as did I. So this will be going back to PC. Hive Jump is first and foremost, first and foremost, a PC game. Um, but it would also be kind of our return to kind of our gamer roots. You know, this is a game for us. A lot of the games we make day in day out are games for you know ages six to eight, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is a game that we would love to play. Um, it's a game inspired by what got us into gaming, you know, old classics like uh, Contra and Metroid. And um, so it's it's been incredibly fulfilling to even consider this as a concept um, and uh, and been a lot of fun to work on it. Now, did you have any other concepts that you were kind of floating around before choosing Hive Jump? And kind of what was it about Hive Jump that made you go with that one? Uh, we really did. And I think what um, we, we had three, maybe four others that you know, got maybe a month or two of, of here and there development. Um, but I think what made them, I think what allowed us to quickly prototype them but never really pursue them was that they were first mobile games and that, you know, mobile games are tricky and that they're fun for kind of intermittent play, but it's hard to craft a game on that type of device that mm-hmm. has lasting appeal yes uh, yeah, there's that, that's plenty a good of mobile point. games yeah there's plenty of mobile games that you can play frequently um but i don't think anybody gets into candy crush for the story you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> so what? yeah i know it's i a love shock. the story in that game what are you talking about exactly so for us uh high jump was ballsy it was not for our demographic it was not for our core platform it was multiplayer and um it was risky, so we felt like if we were going to deviate from our working formula, we better had deviate something that had high risk, high reward. Might so, as well go all in. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. and and that really was the phrase that I think we we uttered when we were talking about what we were going to do was, you know, let's make this something that could be very big, um, because we don't want to roll out of, you know, uh, this kind of daily grind with something that's lukewarm. We want it to be potentially a very big thing, so. Um, you know, we, we started kicking around this idea of a, of a shooter and how we would craft it and, you know, kind of the, what staff that we had, what was the expertise. And we've got some really great sprite artists on staff and some good animators and we were experienced in Unity and Unity had just launched their 2D tool sets. So we're like, oh, all these things are really lining up. Let's make that game. Now, did you always plan to do a Kickstarter for the game, or did that come about kind of later when you were looking to figure out how to do funding? Uh, Kickstarter definitely came later. Um, We had some very, very good friends who a year ago, um, in last February, so almost a year, exactly a year ago, uh, were successful in Kickstarter in a game called Delver's Drop. Um, It's a company called Pixelscopic. And they are in Springfield. They're actually a spinoff from Black Lantern. They're not art. Springfield, Missouri, for those listening who don't know. Uh, yes, I don't correct. think we've mentioned that yet. Thank you for clarifying. Um, <laughs> There's a Springfield in just about every state, it seems like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I always forget to clarify that point. Um, but uh, 
So they were very successful. And while we knew that it wasn't something where we could just bank on their success and just drop a stone in the bucket type of thing, um, we knew that at least we had a, an ally there that we could consult and have them, you know, they would be very uh, helpful in evaluating our plans and giving us some tips and tricks along the way. Um, and then we also had a group here, uh, here in St. Louis that um, were successful about two months later than the previous group. So we thought, okay, we've got two close friends who are successful with Kickstarter. Both rows uh, raised six-figure funds each. Um, so we felt like we could um, learn from them. And we kind of felt like if we were going to do this, um, it had to be the right project. We felt like Hive Jump had enough of those um, characteristics to be the right project. And we also felt like, man, before this market gets completely flooded, if we're going to do some sort of crowdfunding, we better do it soon because it's not getting any, you know, more scarce. So we yeah. just decided to pull the trigger and go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely getting a lot more flooded in the last, you know, couple of years of Kickstarters everywhere, especially yeah, for everybody, gaming. Yeah, everybody <laughs> wants to do something. Everybody's got a mind to do something. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things where at first I was really kind of put off by it. Um, you know, when Schaefer did his big uh, big push and rose like the millions of dollars, I knew there was going to be a flood to it. Um, I guess what kind of changed my mind about it is when we changed our perspective a little bit, and I was consulting with a few people, and you know, they said, hey, man, this is really – you know, you don't have to look at it just as a crowdfunding platform. It, it is. That's what that's what it is. But it's also a really great way for you to build your audience. And if you're a you know a new team as far as the world's concerned, um, and you're trying to build that audience, this is like a, a really nice set of of guidelines of rails that you can use to kind of get in touch with your future community. And so when somebody phrased it that way, I thought like, okay. You know, now I feel like we're a little bit more than just, you know, begging for a buck. But this is really something where at the end of the day, you know, we can still, you know, take care of our livelihood doing the, you know, the work for higher stuff. And, and we still enjoy that. But for us, it was like, if this is something that can help us build an audience and find our audience, and that's really what we're after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting way to look at it. I think of that kind of with a uh, big example out right now. Star Citizen is kind of mm -hmm. doing it that way, to building a huge audience around yeah. it now and with crowdfunding. Yeah. So definitely, especially if you're someone starting out small and no one's heard of you as much, you got to get an audience from somewhere, and that's probably one of the better ways to do it. Mm hmm all right, well, let's talk a little bit about Hive Jump itself, since we haven't kind of gotten into that yet, a little bit of what sure. kind of a game it is. So you've mentioned it's multiplayer, it's a co-op. Did you always, you know, imagine it as co-op from the beginning, or did that kind of come later? Um, well, we've, we we definitely envisioned it first as as multiplayer, but then mm -hmm. we, you know, our experience with with programming multiplayer systems has all been on consoles, where it's a lot more laborious. Mm -hmm. And um, so at first we said, oh, this would be great if we could, like, all of us in the studio play this game. And they're like, eh, but multiplayer is really tricky. So maybe we should think of this kind of like first single player. And, and we did for about a month maybe. Mm -hmm. And then with some really, really great support that Unity has, we started dabbling. One of our programmers started dabbling in the multiplayer system and kind of with a couple of late nights and a weekend surprised us with what was really pretty significant progress on getting multiplayer set up and then that got everybody excited and um, it wasn't until maybe two weeks before the Kickstarter launched that we felt like we had to push the product first as a multiplayer game in order to in order for everyone to kind of perceive it as what we really thought the best way to play was going to be um, yeah. so that's kind of why we made that change and why we present it first as a multiplayer game. Single player is still very possible and still a decent amount of fun. Um, but we just felt like that ideal experience would be playing this game with a bunch of friends. Yeah. It seems like you're hitting on a similar note to some of the uh, other indie uh, titles that have blown up big or semi-big recently, kind of like Risk of Rain or like Terraria mm -hmm. and some of the other ones that style, both in a little bit of your aesthetic, but also 
the style of game it is. Not exactly the same as any of those, but that's kind of sure. what it reminded me when I was looking over the stuff you have on your Kickstarter page. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely a compliment, and I would say that Risk of Rain, Terraria, and Starbound get mentioned at least once each every day that we're yeah. at the office. Um, well, I would say kind of just the way that your levels look kind of mm -hmm. you look like tunnels or something in Terraria or Starbound and kind of a little yeah. bit of the aesthetic as well. A little bit more of, uh, you know, bugs and things going in there and uh, aliens and Starship yeah. Troopers and influence that you kind of mentioned. And a little bit more of that with the aesthetic and kind of what the game is. Yeah. Which I guess uh, we've talked a little bit about, but you want to give sort of a little bit more of sure. a synopsis of the sort of story you slash universe of the game that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So from the top down, Hive Jump is uh, a 2D sci-fi action shooter, um, multiplayer, um, and the real premise of the game is you are a very select group of space marines that are sent to a distant planet that has gone suddenly silent, as distant planets tend to do, uh, <laughs> and uh, to really liquidate, eradicate this very aggressive alien infestation that is or taken what used to be a very uh, docile science research laboratory type of thing. Um, not, not unlike si uh, Starship Troopers, uh, definitely pulling inspiration there. Um, so you're sent out to these planets, to these hives, basically on repeat missions, um, really to clean them up. And the way you do that is one member of your team is carrying this transponder backpack. And it really is the king on the chessboard. It mm -hmm. doesn't really do anything in and of itself, but that backpack has to remain safe as you navigate down below the surface through all of the tunnels and levels um, in search of the queen's room. So the queen of the hive is a room that you're trying to uncover as you dive through all these caverns. And upon reaching that room, you uh, basically set a countdown on that backpack, which beams a signal to your mothership. And then upon the completion of the countdown, the mothership's able to beam in the nuke, and it blows up the hive from the inside just moments after you escape kind of thing. And this process repeats as your mission as uh, space marines are to kind of uh, eradicate these alien beings from all these planets in kind of this sector of the galaxy type of thing. So mm -hmm. as you play more and more, you realize that this is, you know, more than just one jump, more than one hive. And it's all about kind of, uh, you know, jumping on these new hives, amassing, you know, more intelligence about these beings, crafting bigger and more awesome weapons to defeat, you know, stronger versions of the, the aliens. And, uh, you know, really kind of at its core, it's a, it's a little bit of just kind of galaxy domination. Yeah. So is it actually, do you have an end game plan for this, or is it just more kind of open-ended, like you can keep going and going and going? <laughs> um, it, it, the answer is kind of both. So the the hives themselves are definitely f finite. Um, you'll, you'll jump, you'll reach a queen room, you finish it, and you're done. Um, but the play, um, and it's going to sound like a weird uh, relation, but... Um, it's kind of more like League of Legends, where you're playing a single match. Like, you're, you're making mm -hmm. a jump. So you're looking at, like, 30 minutes to, you know, delve into one of these hives and clear it out, get your resources, which then you'll end up almost kind of spending uh, to synthesize new weapons and that sort of thing, just like you would in, like, a League of Legends match. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so unlocking new things that you can then use for additional missions. So is it more an unlock, or do you get a bunch of different kinds of resources and have more crafting, or kind of a weird mix of both? Um, in a way, it's kind of unlock, and then it's crafting. So as a as kind of an example, um, we're working with three specific uh, types of weapons, modifiers, and amplifiers in the demo that we have going right now. Mm -hmm. um, so those weapons are made up of three different things, a material, a modifier, and then an amplifier. So the material might be something like simple bullets or simple gunpowder, I guess, and, uh, or, or fire or plasma. The modifier might be something simple like rapid fire or something more classic like the spread gun, similar to what you see in old Contra, mm -hmm. or maybe something like uh, you know, a, a two-way shot that will shoot in front and behind you. Um, and then the amplifier is something that might modify your power. It might make it 
hit four times harder, but go, you know, you can only shoot one every other second type of thing. And so you unlock those components by um, synthesizing, you know, you kind of working through your research lab and which is kind of like a store economy and unlocking those components. Um, but once they're unlocked, then it's about um, selecting the right combination for that particular jump. So before each jump happens, you get to pick your loadout, you jump. If you die, you go back to the mothership kind of thing, and you get mm -hmm. to pick your loadout. So do you uh, get like a thing before you jump that sort of will, like right. a vague idea of what you should be facing? Like there will be, you know, fire-based enemies here or, you know, something of that nature? Kind uh, of like a vague scan of the surface? Exactly. Some of that. So you'll yeah. have kind of, hey, we've done our readout, and it looks like, you know, we're looking at this type of, you know, we haven't exactly figured out what those metrics will be yet, but yes. let's just say anywhere from like, uh, you know, easy to extreme or something like that. So, so you can plan accordingly. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So how are you planning to do sort of difficulty in the game where you can have like, uh, difficulty settings or is it just ramp up as you go to different highs or sort of each one is a different specific difficulty and also does like a uh, number of players affect it kind of like a uh, uh, nah, brain's leaving me here. But anyway, kind of like, you know, more players equals more difficulty kind of a thing. Certainly more players equals more difficulty. Okay. Um, as an example, just because we've been talking about it in the office, uh, Diablo works very, mm -hmm. with, with some additional intelligence, but works kind of that way. You know, if you have more people jumping in, then the bosses are just harder. Um, so there's definitely some of that. Um, and then as you play more and more, the way we envision this... Um, you know, as we kind of expand this this project and the scope is that, you know, different hives would have different difficulty levels. So if there was one like on the outer rim of the galaxy and it was labeled as like super extreme, then maybe the three of us on this call would, you know, pair up and we'd have to go tackle this particular hive because it was so tough. And maybe we need to get three other, you know, friends on the jump with us because it just requires that, you know, that many more people. Um, one thing that's unique about this game is um, I, I, your jump team survives as long as that backpack stays intact. So when you die, that backpack gets kind of ejected, um, which is actually pretty funny when you watch it happen. But it gets kind of ejected like an ejector seat in a plane. And um, then the bugs go like race after it to try and destroy it. Um, well, your other jumpers can catch that backpack. So you can kind of you know, uh, you know, lob this backpack here and there to your other jumpers um, to kind of keep it safe. Um, so as long as that backpack survives, you can keep spawning endlessly. So the more people you have in your jump, the better chance you have of just protecting that backpack and um, and surviving the jump ultimately. Yeah, sounds really really cool. Um, I noticed uh, the. Kickstarter, you mentioned everything is procedurally generated, the levels. Does that come with any particular challenges, or does it make some design aspects easier for you? Um, so it's certainly, um, it's certainly uh, you know, not a, a silver bullet. I mean, there has to be a lot of refinement um, as we go along to make sure everything is, is pieced together. But that, you know, that method of generation we took very... Um, uh, heavy inspiration from like Derek Yu and Spelunky where they make, you know, modules and then piece those modules together mm -hmm. um, based on their in and out points, um, which is a, a really great way to do it. And, you know, we saw no need to really reinvent the wheel there. Um, we were able to get some really nice serpentine hive-like, uh, you know, very cavernous uh, generations by doing it that way. Um, so those individual modules get built, um, you know, kind of like glorified puzzle pieces by our design team, so they can look very deliberate, um, but when they get all pieced together, they're still very randomized, so you can, um, you know, generate, you know, 50 different hive layouts very quickly um, and have them still look deliberate and well detailed, but, um, but they're still new each time you jump into one. All right. So if Hive Jump goes really, really well, what do you want to do next? Do you plan on doing some more original titles or? I would love to. <laughs> I would love to. I mean, this this type of game, I just feel like, um, 
you know, we've really got more of a, you know, our hands on a general archetype here that, you know, we could see this same approach, you know, working really, really well with kind of like a, you know, a fantasy inspiration versus a sci-fi inspiration. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we would love to keep working on, you know, our own ideas. We've been doing, um, games for other people for about 10 years now and it's been thrilling and fun but I feel like we just have you know much much more to offer the games industry and um, and it's been so much fun even working just these short couple of months on Hive Jump that you know if we were to get you know the next eight months to focus on this thing I, I'd just be thrilled and I think we could make something really awesome in those eight months. Now, as far as the Kickstarter goes, uh, what do you guys have plans if you don't reach your goal? If you do reach your goals, all your different like stretch goals and things like that, I've noticed you've got laid out that were pretty sure. well. So, kind of, what are the plans with uh, all of that? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, as you can see, kind of from where our campaign's at right now, I mean, Kickstarter is not without its challenges, um, mm-hmm. but we, um, you know, we felt like Kickstarter was really a way to connect with our community first. And we'll keep using it to do that. Um, and, you know, second, it's a way for us to accelerate development, provide some focus for it. Um, so let's just say Kickstarter was done and we, we didn't reach it. Um, what we'd be doing next is the answer is we would continue to be working on Hive Jump. We couldn't afford to do it as much as we are, um, as much as we are now. Um, but, you know, we'd be looking at maybe a 2015 release instead of a 2014 release type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um and we would be without the support to do all the cool backer gifts, um, you know, all the, all the, um, you know, additional content pieces and, and other things that we want to do as part of that Kickstarter funding. Um, you know, some of those might have to take a back seat or just be limited in quantity. So, um, you know, Kickstarter, when used, uh, you know, appropriately, can do some really cool, awesome things. Um, but if it doesn't turn out to be that way for us, then We'll continue pushing forward with this particular product, just take a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the interesting things I noticed that you guys have your offering through the Kickstarter is if you oh. buy in at certain levels, you get free codes for friends when the game comes out. Yeah, and that was something that um, we did announce that after we kickstarted. It was about mm-hmm. a week after we kickstarted. Um, and for us, it was, um, you know, we had. We haven't really seen anybody else doing it, um, and we felt like, you know, what would really make us, you know, the most satisfied, the happiest, is if we had, you know, a million people playing this game. Um, and to do that, we knew we'd have to be aggressive. So as a commitment to, you know, our backers and to how serious we are at getting this game in as many hands as possible, um, we made what we feel is a pretty competitive offer. Uh, at $30, uh, once the game releases, you get your own unique recruiter code that you can pass out to anyone you'd like, and they can download the game for free. So um, is that like an unlimited number? Yeah, it's... Or specific, it's a, like you get, you can invite four friends or something like that? It is it is a... We have not come up with a quantity for it. Okay. Um, as close as we've gotten is we've said tons and loads and, <laughs> you know, uh, like the stars and... <laughs> Um, so a few then. <laughs> yeah, a few. Um, so our idea is that if you have somebody that you think would enjoy this game and you back our project, you can give them that this game. I think it's um, a smart idea because I know some other things that I've looked at, it'd be like, yeah, I kind of like to play that, but none of my friends are probably going to buy this game and I'd have to like beg them to get it. So if you can just like give it to them, then they might be, you know, more likely to try it and play it with you if they can just go, oh, it's free, why not? You know, so I think that's kind of a smart idea is definitely unique at least as far as what i've seen so that's awesome no exactly i mean this is this is what we want we like that multiplayer experience and we don't want anybody to be stopped by you know having to go coach their you know coax their friends into you know picking up the game so you back at 30 bucks you get a link to give your friends as many of them as you have and if you back at 55 you can invite your friends to the beta as well now, do you have any dates for when you're wanting to hopefully hit beta and that type of thing and when you want to release yet, or is that still kind of in flux? We, we don't have a date for the beta just yet, but if, um, if we're able to get fully funded, then our release date um, would be September 2014. So um, if you backpedal that by a month or two, um, I would imagine the beta would be sometime July, August. Mm-hmm. 
All right, one final uh, quick question that I'm going to kind of copy from your FAQ on the Kickstarter because I'm sure people sure. will be interested in it. If you're sure. really successful, you know, are you going to come to other platforms? We would love to. Yeah. Um, you know, we've we've got experience on those platforms, and I feel like we're a little unique in that way. Um, I haven't seen a lot of teams jumping on Kickstarter that have already had published product on some of these bigger consoles. You know, it's weird that we have. Um, so to have to finally bring an idea of our own to one of these platforms would be really a dream come true. So um, definitely have our eyes on yeah. platforms like the the Wii U, the PS4, the Xbox One. Um, we also have the burden of knowledge and understanding that those platforms are not easy to get <laughs> onto. Yes. Uh, you know, so that's kind of one of the the drags that we find. You know. We, we ask for a big amount on Kickstarter because we know that's really what it takes to get a product made. Um, we aren't throwing out wily stretch goals of just jumping out into consoles because we know that those are really, a lot of those aren't even within our control. You know, you have to get certified as a developer, which we happen to be, but there's just a lot of other moving parts. So I feel like we're trying to be, you know, honest and forthright with our, our, our fans and saying that, you know, those aren't easy, easy things to add, but you know, trust us when we say if those opportunities exist, we would love to get on those consoles. Yeah, I hope you're successful and that you can get it on there and PC, just kind of get it everywhere because the more people you can get it to, more places, the better for, you know, exposure and all that. And it certainly yeah. seems like the type of game that would work well on kind of like the online marketplaces of all the consoles. We think that would be really great. You know, we're working on local co-op um, and, uh, you know, definitely taking putting early attention on making sure controller support is, is well handled and you know, everything feels real good uh, as far as a console could be concerned. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're planning ahead, I think, as much as we can be and, uh, and would love to see this game on as many platforms as would have it. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the show and talking with us for a while. It's been really interesting. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And if uh, you guys listening want more information, you can go to HiveJump.com, correct? That is your guys' website? Uh, yeah, HiveJump.com. And then the Kickstarter, sure. you can get to the Kickstarter from there. And I'll have links in our show notes as well. So yep. that's how you can find out a little bit more about the game. Go, go and check it out. Go and watch their video kind of introduction thingy on the Kickstarter page and look at the art and things they've released so far because I think it looks really, really cool. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun, and I wish you guys the best of luck. Awesome. Yes, Thanks definitely. so much, guys. You're welcome. All right, well, that'll wrap it up for this show, I think, so uh, hand it off to you, Eric, to close us out like you normally do. All right. Um, here's how to get a hold of us and follow us and whatnot. You can email us at podcast at the dash gamers dash lounge dot com. You can follow us on Twitter at GL underscore podcast. I'm Eric, and I'm at Cube00. Zero zero. Uh, John, who's not here, he's at JC Meadows 94 And Nathaniel is at Polygon underscore Wizard. Uh, and you can check out the site at uh, thegamerslounge.com. That's the with a dash gamers dash lounge.com. We have reviews, um, uh, editorials, uh, links to the show notes, links to other, other sites. Check it out. You know, leave a comment. Send us an email. We yeah. like feedback. Yeah, we've had some cool stuff go up on the site since we launched it, I think. So it be interesting to see kind of who puts up what, what they're interested in. I think that's one of our unique selling points is we've got a few different viewpoints from people who are interested in different things. So Yeah, we all like games. We just have different opinions on stuff. Yeah. And, you know, you have some of us who are addicted to Minecraft, some of us who are not. So, you know, people looking at different different directions. So, yes, <laughs> me right now, I have enough limited time. That's kind of like if I'm going to put anything up, it's probably going to be Minecraft related because I can spew on and on about that game <laughs> probably if I wanted to on a, any number of topics. I think I need to uh, maybe put up an article soon about what's coming up in Minecraft 1.8 update since they've had a bunch of like kind of the snapshots of that coming out there it seems like they're winding down a little bit so it's almost feeling like about the point in time where they're going to announce finally when that will actually come out yeah i'm sure people i'm sure people would be interested 
Yeah, because uh, if you're not like me, like I follow a few of those guys on Twitter, I watch a bunch of stuff on YouTube, so I'm pretty up to date. But if you're not up to date on that stuff, it's kind of like, well, I don't want to have to look here, there, everywhere for it. Where do I look for info? So maybe I'll do that. Hopefully I have time to get something like that put together. You got anything that you're kind of itching to write? Um, I'll probably have an article, probably a review of XCOM. Maybe the Last of Us DLC, and maybe another Top Deals article or stuff like that. I like those Top Deals articles because I like to compare stuff that's coming out, what sort of pre-order bonuses you get. Um, unfortunately, most of the time, most of the pre-order bonuses are kind of, well, do I really need another poster? <laughs> the cool stuff. Where's the plush, the plushes and things like that? Or that. Uh, that's uh, another topic for another show. You know, if I can get a remote control Titan from Titanfall that can lay waste to my neighborhood, that would be a cool pre-order bonus. <laughs> I would. And it would just run around, you know, it's like it's like the size of an RC car and shoots like little pellets and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'd be interested in something like that. That would be cool. All right, well, that'll do it for the show this week. I mean, uh, check in next week. John will hopefully be back, and maybe he'll he's a little more used to the main host duties. I hope he did all right, but he'll probably make fun of me. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll be back next uh, next week with another show, and keep your eyes tuned to the Twitter feed and the uh, art, uh, to the site for new articles. Yeah, thank you guys for listening. See you guys later.